hit the recording. Yeah, you um, might want to have people who are on video tr hit their video button to turn their video off if they don't want to be on video because it looks like you got a few people with their video on. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, good point. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, for those that are on East Coast, good afternoon. For folks that are on um, West Coast or um, someplace else, um, welcome to our virtual meetup. As you know, we have three groups gathered together. Um, I I'll let uh, the group host of the other two meetups speak. We, we have uh, Yekaterina Stepanova. Yekaterina, welcome. Yes. Hey, welcome. Say a few words. Yes, sure. Alina, thank you very much. And uh, Shike, Brian, thank you very much for uh, making the time and making this uh, meetup happen. Um, my name is Katrina Stepanova here to represent MHP Tribe people, a mobile home park investor, uh, owner and operator. I'm in New York, uh, have uh, properties anywhere out but in New York. <laughs> well, they're across the country, pretty much. So here, hoping to gain some insights from uh, Brian's uh, experience and perspective on current economy and, uh, and just state of affairs in real estate, commercial real estate. And all, everyone welcome. Um, I hope we can have also as many people from MHP tribe joining and gaining insights uh, from Brian as we can, although they might be showing us Ekaterina Stefan. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you, Katerina. And um, we also have uh, Chike with his meetup. Um, Chike, would you like to say yep. a few words? Hey, um, so I'll just <laughs> do a quick intro. I am Chike, one of the uh, co-organizers of the Invest Up um, Multifamily Investment Club. We are based out in New York and we focus on helping individuals, whether active or passive investors, to learn about investing in multifamily and actually executing um, deals as well. So, yeah. That's us. Thank you, guys. And uh, my name is Alina Trigup. I'm the host of the Power of Passive Investing. I host two meetups. One is in the city, one is in New Jersey. Uh, well, and the third one is virtual, as you may notice. Um, virtual works best these days, so we decided to go virtually. And um, it's great to have my partners with me, Chiki and Katrina. And we welcome everyone here. And we're also very excited to have um, our presenter today, Brian Burke. Some of you may have heard Brian. Some of you may have seen his um, extensive, lengthy, and detailed uh, posts and explanations and uh, on bigger pockets. Uh, some of you may even have read his book that recently came out, but already making um, Amazon number one. If you haven't checked it out, I strongly encourage you to check it out. Um, it's very educational in nature. So, without um, any more ado, uh, Brian, welcome and please take the stage. All right. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me to be here, Alina, and, and the whole crew, all three meetups. Uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to share uh, my observations of uh, the real estate market with you guys. I, I made a few slides. I don't like you have like a big uh, drawn out presentation or anything, but I did make a few here that I think will uh, help to illustrate some of the points. So let me bring that up on the screen for you guys. And uh, we'll just, we'll run through some stuff. Then uh, I think this will probably take maybe about, you know, 20, 30 minutes. Who knows? Maybe I'll talk too long and we'll go for 40. But uh, after that, we'll have plenty of time for questions uh, for you guys to, uh, to pick my brain and pretty much ask me anything you want about uh, all things real estate. Uh, so without any further ado, let's get on. I'll, I'll introduce you a little bit to my background and the team that I work with uh, here at Praxis Capital. Um, so we, uh, here we go. Uh, so there's me, uh, I've been in real estate for about 30 years, uh, been through, I guess, uh, I don't know how many market cycles. It's probably about five or six now, uh, when you add up the big market cycles and the small market cycles. Uh, I've, uh, I've purchased about 730 properties, give or take, uh, in those 30 years, last year, I just crossed the half a billion dollar mark in real estate that I've been able to acquire, which was kind of a 
a, a wow. fun uh, milestone for me and one I, I never would have imagined uh, ever hitting back in my, you know, broke uh, early uh, real estate investor days. Uh, but somehow managed to make it from there to here. Uh, now we have a multifamily portfolio of over 3,000 units uh, scattered in several states across the U.S. Uh, the rest of my team, uh, I, I brought in a, a CFO and a, a chief investment officer about three years ago. They, the, t- the two of them together brought us about uh, 65,000 units of multifamily experience. And then we started up our own property management company to manage our own assets. So we have full control of our portfolio. Uh, I brought in Lyle to manage uh, that process. He has 40 years in this business and over 40,000 units of multifamily management experience. So, you know, a lot of people belong to a mastermind group and those kind of things to help them uh, see the straight and narrow when they're trying to figure out what's going on in the real estate market. I've got my mastermind group right here. Uh, you know, the, we, we talk on a daily basis and, and share our uh, prognostications about the real estate market and the economy in general, because uh, we have this portfolio all over the country and we've got experience all over the country. And so the, the states highlighted in blue here are states where we have operational experience from someone in our team. And I know that there are states that aren't, uh, that aren't highlighted here. Like for example, I own 10 units in New York. Uh, I don't have it blue, so I guess I need to get back to the drawing board. But nevertheless, uh, coast to coast, we've got experience. Uh, I'm based in Santa Rosa, California, which is north of San Francisco, uh, about 40 miles. So it's still daylight here. Uh, Our portfolio now is about 250 million of assets under management. We have over 1,000 investor positions from private investors. All the real estate that we acquire, we do it with high net worth individuals and family office who fund either into a single asset syndication or uh, into a multi-asset fund. Uh, One or the other of those uh, strategies is how people participate with us. Uh, We've got 37 previous offerings. Um, One thing I'm really proud of is that we have a very high reinvestment rate. Uh, Our investors reinvest over and over and over again at a very, very high percentage, uh, which we're very proud of. This portfolio is growing now. It's interesting. I had full plans this year to sell about a thousand units and we were going to try to buy 2000 units this year uh, just to expand our portfolio by 1000 in order to net a thousand. We had to buy 2000. We bought a thousand units last year. So I figured it was probably possible, but now uh, this is how the economy will deal you a new hand and you got to pivot and figure out a different plan. So uh, we've got a different plan now and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go along and and, and fill in the holes in the questions. Alina mentioned earlier uh, about a book. I I just, this literally came out, I think what, two weeks ago uh, on Amazon, maybe not even that long ago. And it came out on biggerpockets.com about a, a month ago. Uh, the hands-off investor. The, the book is designed to teach passive investors how to invest in, in syndications, uh, how to uh, find, uh, how to uh, conduct due diligence on and make investments in uh, passive real estate offerings. Uh, I, I also, you know, I'm a real estate investor at, uh, in my core. So a lot of the book discusses tactics and strategies around real estate investing, which anybody, whether you invest passively or actively would benefit from, uh, but it's really designed for the passive investor. And, you know, I, I think it's important that passive investors understand real estate concepts, just like a building inspector needs to know uh, construction techniques. Uh, passive investors need to know real estate investment techniques, at least enough to be able to determine whether or not the people they're investing with are uh, doing the right things and making the right decisions. So anyway, that's available now if you want to check it out. So, you know, the, the market outlook, you know, where are we and, and uh, are we there yet? You know, have we, have we reached a a bottom or a top uh, and what's going to happen next? This is the big question. Uh, You know, a real estate cycle is often said to look kind of like this where, Uh, You know, you have the boom market, you have a recession and the market goes down and then, you know, the market comes back in in the next boom market and you want to buy at the bottom and sell at the top. And, you know, this may all be really nice to look at on a slide, but the real world doesn't work like this at all. In the real world, a market cycle really looks a lot more like this, where you've got all kinds of different cycles happening at the same time where 
Uh, you know, you've got one area might be doing better than another, one sector might be doing better than another. So for example, let's apply this to what we see today. Uh, hotels, restaurant uh, properties, retail, uh, that is struggling right now and is likely to continue to struggle. Transaction velocity is gonna be way down. Uh, prices are probably gonna be down uh, and probably will stay there for a long time. Yet at the same time, uh, single family residential, uh, has held up very well in most markets that I follow. Multifamily residential is holding on uh, better than I expected. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of different cycles at play. So it's important that you consider the type of real estate you're investing in and where you're investing. Uh, good example, we have a lot of, uh, about 2,000 units in Atlanta, Georgia. Georgia opened for business, I don't know what, a month ago? Uh, but I live in California and California, we're still kind of shut down. So real estate's gonna perform differently in those different areas. And you, know, you have to be mindful of that when you think about what investments you might be wanting to make. Uh, just to expand on that just a little bit, in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, our, our highest apartment rent's probably 1300 bucks. Uh, everybody just got a $1,200 stimulus per person. They're getting $600 a week of unemployment if they're not employed. When you figure that uh, our average resident probably earns 35,000 a year uh, to live in a $1,200 or $1,300 apartment, they're making more money on unemployment than they were when they were working. So there would be little reason for them to default on their rent. And, and we've noticed that our rent collections for April were 100 104% of March collections, our May collections are tracking even stronger than April collections. So, so far we haven't seen a big fallout on the multifamily side uh, for that reason alone. But you know, what happens later, uh, we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. There's been a question uh, and a lot of discussion uh, whether this is gonna be a U-shaped recovery or a V-shaped recovery. Uh, and the difference being, you know, the V-shaped recovery, it's a very steep drop followed by a very sharp climb. And, you know, depending on who you listen to, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about us going into a robust recovery in Q3 and Q4 with 2021 being almost back to normal. Uh, you know, that's one thesis that's out there. The other thesis is the U-shaped recovery where we just kind of, you know, we go through this little uh, episode, we come right back out and we just start shooting right back up. I think the answer uh, really is neither of the two. So if there's a none of the above option here, I'd like to choose it. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a third option. The, uh, the third option I'm gonna give you guys is uh, one you might be familiar with if you ever bought shoes or a baseball hat or a, a polo shirt is the old Nike swoosh. Uh, I have a feeling that the, uh, the economic events that are going on right now are gonna look a lot like this, where you have this rapid decline followed by a slow and steady recovery. And using kind of the same graphic we used from the last slide, it might look something more like this. So it's not really a U, it's not really a V, it's just more of a, you know, we, we took a major hit and then we start to uh, claw our way out of it. So the question is, where are we now? You know, are we here? Is, is this today uh, on this continuum or are we here? And remember the green circle is buy, right? Buy, buy, buy. Uh, so are we, are we at A or are we at B? Or uh, is it possible that we're actually at C? And uh, you know, if, if I was a betting man, which I'm really not, I, I don't mind going to Las Vegas, but I've probably never spent more than 10 bucks on gambling while I'm there. Uh, but I would probably take my, uh, my $10 Las Vegas gambling budget and put it on C. I have a feeling that's where we're at right now. Uh, now, why do I think that? Uh, let's, let's go through a few, a few things, a few observations and talk about why I think we're at C. Uh, there was a, uh, about, uh, I guess it was a month and a half ago now, there was a tornado that ripped through downtown Nashville. Uh, it caused all kinds of damage and, and struck uh, a few neighborhoods and took a direct hit. And what was interesting was the very next day after that tornado, uh, you could see it on the news. I mean, the, the cavalry came, right? Everybody was out volunteering. They were helping clean debris out of the streets. And, you know, it was all hands on deck. 
uh, the morning after that tornado. But what happens uh, two months after or three months after or six months after that tornado when the volunteers went back to work or went back to doing what they were doing and, you know, the cavalry was gone, but geez, your house, the roof was still torn off. You haven't had the roof put back on yet, but there's the cavalry is gone. And what happens then? Uh, that's what I think is probably going to happen here is, you know, right now the cavalry was a uh, stimulus payment. The cavalry was a $600 a week unemployment benefit that runs until the end of, I think it's June, uh, maybe it's July, I don't remember which. Uh, the Calvary was uh, the PPP loan, the payroll protection program loan that helps small businesses keep uh, employees on payroll. Uh, those, uh, that wash of stimulus that came over us has really helped stabilize the economy. We, we noticed a lot of residents who were laid off from jobs actually coming in and paying pre-COVID delinquencies. In other words, they were ready to be evicted before this all happened and then came in and paid up all their arrearages because they got their tax return check, they got their stimulus check, they got their unemployment check, uh, and they realized that a roof over the head was really important. So uh, now what happens? What happens when uh, those, those payments end and businesses are still laying people off uh, how, how long is it going to take for people to get back on airplanes and travel? How long is it going to take for hotels to fill up, restaurants to fill up? Uh, you know, obviously none of us have the answers to these questions, but uh, the V-shaped recovery would mean that happens pretty quickly. And I, I don't see that it's going to uh, play out that way. Uh, it's going to take some time for those things to happen. So we may have a little bit more fallout left, uh, uh, folks, I'm afraid to tell you, but you know, that of course creates opportunity. So what does it feel like to be a real estate investor? I mean, if, if you don't feel like this cat, uh, something's wrong with you. I mean, you really got to feel uh, pretty nervous right now that, uh, you know, that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of danger out there and you got to uh, keep watch for it. So we know that there's risk out there. What are we going to do to defend ourselves? Uh, the big three drivers of commercial real estate are job growth, population growth, and income growth. None of those things are here right now. You know, we, we don't really have job growth. In fact, we have massive job losses like never before seen in history. Uh, as a result, there's, you know, there was a little bit of income growth in the beginning when uh, companies like Amazon and grocery stores were, were popping wages a couple dollars an hour. Uh, but, you know, what happens when unemployment goes up and people are looking for work? Uh, it's going to uh, put downward pressure on wages. So income growth might take a, a bit of a breather in the short term. It'll probably come roaring back later, but in the short term, uh, probably not going to see too much of that. Population growth, well, you know, they shut off immigration. Uh, they even shut off travel. So, you know, there's, uh, there's not going to be a ton of population growth, I don't think. But watch for localized population growth. And this is something I've been preaching for years. I've been saying it at conferences and on podcasts and in my book for I don't even know how long I'll always be looking to invest in in uh, in places that people are moving to because their populations are growing that's still going to happen people are still going to move to some areas and move out of other areas and you know watch for uh, watch for that demographic shift and stay ahead of it and that's going to help you stack the deck in your favor so if we don't have the big three drivers of commercial real estate right now uh, what do we need to be cautious of? Well, first is don't overestimate rent growth. If you look at uh, past rent growth in a lot of markets, this is a report I pulled out of Axiometrics for some random city. I can't remember which, uh, you know, pick a town, could have been Houston or it could have been uh, Tucson, could have been Phoenix, could have been Atlanta. I don't know. Pull this out of somewhere, but this is their, uh, their historic rent growth, you know, over 5% a year, 2018, six and a half percent forecasts were coming out, uh, quite a bit lower in this particular market. And then some other markets were coming out a lot higher than historical rent growth. But right now, the problem is, is none of those uh, forecasts mean anything. So you can't look at a rent growth forecast that's from the, uh, the, uh, the economists and apply that to your underwriting and just assume that's gonna continue in the near term. 
So uh, this is a number one, when you're looking for real estate or you're looking to invest in a passive offering, you're looking to buy actively, whatever it is that you're doing, be very careful about how you're forecasting future rent growth. I would be careful about underwriting any growth at all. Right now we're underwriting to 0% rent growth for the first two years. We're also not underwriting to raising rents to comps. So let's say that the property is performing, uh, let's say a blended overall effective, uh, 800 bucks a month, um, they've over the last 90 days been leasing out properties for 850. Um, but you know, the, the uh, properties next door are getting a thousand. Uh, I might be comfortable underwriting to that 850 and assuming that, you know, they're getting that $50 bump already. We can probably continue to do that, but can we get to, uh, a thousand? I, I wouldn't try it right now. Uh, now, I might buy the property and assuming I'm going to get to 850 and then try to get a thousand. And of course, if we do, then, you know, that's great. That's icing on the cake, but I wouldn't be underwriting to a thousand. Uh, gotta be really careful about that. So watch out for, uh, for rent growth. We may even see rent declines. Uh, let me relate this a little bit to some things that um, happen. Let me go to the next slide. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this example on, on this one. So this, this is a, a, a slide showing vacancy rates. I picked, um, uh, Texas. Uh, I don't, not picking on Texas, nothing wrong with Texas. It's a great market. Uh, it used to be the market I owned more real estate in than any other, but not anymore. Um, but this is a chart showing their vacancy rate. And, uh, you know, if you look at the vacancy rate in the mid 2000s, it, uh, you know, it peaked uh, in the 14% range. And then, you know, as of late, you know, when the market was getting really good, it was going below 9%. It started to average about seven and a half to eight in 2019 uh, until COVID came along. And, you know, who knows what direction it heads uh, now. But the point of this is that when you're looking at a real estate acquisition, one thing you really want to pay attention to is what vacancy rate you're forecasting. And you don't want to get too aggressive, assuming that your vacancy rate is going to maintain what it always has. So, uh, you know, if the property right now is 95% occupied uh, and the submarket average is 95%, normally you might underwrite to a 95% uh, vacancy rate going forward, or maybe a 94% occupancy rate going forward. But if you're, uh, uh, if you're really cautious, uh, one thing that, I, that I've always tended to do is I'll look at the submarket overall vacancy rate, and then I'll look at the historic average. And, you know, maybe the historic average might be 90% occupancy, but right now it's at 94. I might underwrite to 92 and split the difference, or maybe 94 if it really feels like it's a strong market and is not going back. But now I'd be looking at things like, you know, what is that long-term vacancy average or what is the past adverse market cycle vacancy peak and looking to see what that would do to your performance. And if you look at Texas, it peaked at 14%. If your property went 14% vacant, what would happen? Would you be in negative cash flow or still positive? Uh, that's something to consider now a lot more so than maybe you might have considered even last year, even though you probably should have. Uh, so I was going to talk to you about an example, a, a recent example uh, that we went through, and this was in Houston, Texas. We owned a property. Uh, we have quite a few properties in Houston, Texas, but uh, we, were, we had one left in our portfolio when Hurricane Harvey hit. Hurricane Harvey was kind of similar to COVID in a way. Uh, it was much more localized, obviously, but when Hurricane Harvey swept through Houston, uh, it flooded a lot of the uh, city. It shut down a lot of areas where you couldn't get to them. Uh, you really couldn't leave your house unless you had a boat. Uh, and the courthouses were closed because they were, uh, the courthouse in our jurisdiction where our property is located was damaged by flood water. So they literally closed the courthouse. That meant there was no evictions. And you know, if you look at right now, there's an eviction moratorium, right? Uh, so then there was a de facto eviction moratorium just because there was no courthouse to go to to evict even if you wanted to. The other thing that happened is businesses were shut down for obvious reasons. A lot of them were damaged. That meant that people were losing jobs. Uh, that meant that uh, they were losing income or at least they were losing hours. And what we saw at the property was we saw an increase in vacancy, a sharp increase in bad debt. Uh, we saw an increase in concessions to try to maintain occupancy. 
uh, you know, delinquencies really went through the roof, not only because of the, uh, the job losses, but because we couldn't evict anyway, and everybody knew it. They knew it would take three, four, five months to get them out, so they just stopped paying. All those things combined meant that uh, we really, really struggled, and uh, it was not a V-shaped recovery. They drained the water. Uh, they fixed the businesses. Everybody opened back up, but a year and a half later, we had not one dollar of rent growth. We fought our way back to normalize bad debt. It literally took an entire 18 months to do that. Uh, we barely hung on to occupancy uh, in the low 90s, but uh, we only were able to do that because we gave away a lot of free rent through concessions. So that, that looks a lot like what we're seeing today, uh, you know, and there's a lot of parallels to be drawn from that. And I think uh, we're, we're going to see some similar things happen over the course of the next 18 months. Brian, can I, I'm sorry, can I just ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, so you were just uh, saying, uh, you know, the the rents, how they, uh, well, not the rents, but occupancy and the economic occupancy, how, you know, you guys were naturally struggling with that. And you know how right now um, most folks kind of share with each other, oh, you know, we're perfect. We had 99, 95% collections and everybody is golden. And so tell us, please, when do you think we're going to start feeling it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's like just, just the, tell the other, us. Yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> the, uh, the other shoe hasn't dropped yet, uh -huh. right? I mean, yep. right now you're, you're being held up by stimulus. Yep. Uh, you know, there's, there's economic stimulus. There's, uh, there's unemployment benefits that are layered on top of conventional unemployment benefits. There were tax returns, uh, tax refunds that went out recently. All of those things have come together to support uh, the multifamily industry. Now, they, they obviously weren't uh, billed as a bailout for multifamily, right? They were shown as yeah. here, we're helping, <laughs> we're helping the average American. And, and it's true, that's what was happening. But ultimately, this was in some respects uh, a bailout for the housing industry because people would not pay their mortgage or their rent if they didn't have the money to do so. So the stimulus money they received assisted them in doing that. But that's going to end, right? So there was a one-time stimulus of $1,200 a person. Mm -hmm. That's behind us now. Uh, tax refunds are behind us now, by and large. Mm -hmm. uh, the $600 a month uh, uh, unemployment benefit is still here. I think it's until the end of July, but it might be the end of June. I just don't remember. I, oh, I actually looked this up the other day, and then I forgot. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's, that's coming. Now, I, the reason that I, I forgot was I wasn't paying a, a large amount of attention to when it expired because I really have a feeling that it's going to get extended. And, you know, if, if we're still in uh, massive layoffs when that's, when that's over with, I, I strongly suspect the government's going to extend that by one or two months, maybe three months, mm -hmm. but it's not going to go on forever. Eventually, they're going to stop doing that. Uh, and when they do, that might be when the other shoe drops. So I wish I could say the other shoe is going to drop in September. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I can't. I can't say that with any confidence and say that we know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, I would just be prepared for it to happen. And, you know, if, you're, um, uh, if, if you have a property that has uh, some reserves uh, and you're looking at making a distribution to investors, uh, mm -hmm. you, uh, but you don't have a lot of reserves, I would strongly consider... Uh, suspending distributions right now mm -hmm. uh, and retaining that cash for a rainy day because there's clouds on the horizon and the wind is starting to blow. So you know that it might start to rain soon. So keep the cash. If you've got, and, and so we have them all across the board. We have some of our entities where we are so flushed with cash. We literally have millions of dollars because we raised all the money for renovations and everything. And that money's sitting there in cash. We yep. raised a lot of cash reserves and, and that's sitting there. I'm completely comfortable making investor distributions in those entities. Mm -hmm. We've had other entities where we've already completed our, uh, our renovation program. So we spent a lot of the money. We had a lot of cash reserves. Um, so we're okay, um, but we don't have millions. And on those, I'm suspending distributions just to uh, retain and hoard cash. I figure if everybody else can go uh, hoard toilet paper from the grocery store, I can hoard cash in our, uh, in our multifamily entities and safeguard and protect our investments. And, and that's what I'm doing right now until there's a little bit more known to the mm -hmm. economy. 
I feel like the smart thing to do is to retain cash. Uh, so yeah, I'd strongly uh, recommend doing that okay. and wait for that other shoe to drop. And, you know, I think we're going to see that other shoe in the third or fourth quarter uh, of this year. We might, we might see that happen. The other thing that we might see happen later this year is, mm -hmm. Uh, is more loan defaults. There's a lot of real estate sponsors that shouldn't have been real estate sponsors uh, that were acquiring property using other people's money uh, with thin budgets, low reserves, uh, small balance sheets on the on behalf of the uh, managing partner, uh, maybe not an extensive amount of experience. Uh, and a lot of those are, are, uh, are going to struggle and it's going gonna, it's gonna to wash out some groups there's already been a spike in foreclosures uh, at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And when I say a spike, it means it went from like 0.25% to 0.5% or whatever the number is. It, it like, I think they, I heard the other day that it went up like 5X, but that meant that there was like 39 loans in default or some, some just ridiculous number um, where, you know, it's not a, a, it's not a pandemic of its own uh, but the, the defaults are already, you know, delinquencies are already starting to show and it's likely that you're going to see more of those. And when you see more of those, that's just going to create even more distress and it's going to feed upon itself to an extent. Is this going to look like 2008 where we had a, a precipitous drop in real estate value? I don't think so. I mean, if you're in the um, uh, hotel, uh, hotel properties, restaurant properties, retail properties, maybe even office, uh, I, I would think that there's a, a little bit more uh, risk there. Uh, on the multifamily and single family side, probably to a lesser degree. Now let's say you're, you're thinking about uh, buying uh, right now and you wanna take advantage of the opportunities that are gonna be presented by the dislocations in the market. What can we do to defend ourselves uh, from making a mistake that throws us into that, uh, that Fannie Mae foreclosure statistic. Well, the number one for me is debt structure. This is really what it comes down to, folks, when you're buying real estate. If you followed my earlier advice and you underwrote to zero to no rent growth, maybe pricing with in-place rents, not trying to get too crazy about keeping up with the comps, uh, you, know, you didn't, uh, you allowed for plenty of economic vacancy. If you took all that advice, uh, you're on, you're, you're well on your way, but this one is the most important of all is don't over leverage. Don't borrow so much money that the slightest hiccup is going to throw you into negative cash flow. There was a big trend recently from people buying, uh, multifamily assets using high leverage bridge debt with three year maturities at 90% to cost. Uh, and raising very little cash reserve. And uh, it's, not a, it's not the way to build a portfolio uh, unless you don't like sleeping at night. So I would advise against over leveraging, maybe stick to 65% LTV, maybe 70% LTV, uh, at the most 75 LTV. Uh, I wouldn't uh, be excited about going any uh, higher than that. If you're planning on doing any renovations, either raise that money up front or plan to do it from a refinance later on down the line as opposed to buying on a bridge loan that has uh, a reserve built into it for uh, making those improvements that you're paying interest on even if you haven't drawn uh, that money. Be careful about that. Watch out for maturity risk on short-term debt. Uh, you know, there's a lot of three-year loans out there. Uh, some of them will have extension options which helps mitigate some of that risk but be careful about uh, short-term debt and having that maturity risk. Uh, where, where are you gonna get the debt is another big question. Bridge lenders, uh, gosh, a lot of them are gone. Uh, many, many bridge lenders that were very active in the space are completely out of business. Some of them folded up shop. Some of them are going under. Uh, some of them are just pausing, uh, pressing the pause button, not doing any originations for right now. Uh, so it's kind of all across the board. Uh, CMBS lenders uh, are almost entirely out of business. Uh, I've heard of very few CMBS uh, deals being done right now. And there's not a lot of any deals being done right now, but certainly CMBS is kind of out. Uh, but so who is lending? Right now, the, uh, the reliable sources for multifamily capital, at least, is the agencies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, they're still actively lending. 
they have changed some of their requirements. Uh, debt service coverage ratios are changing, interest only periods are changing, reserves uh, or the uh, uh, interest spreads were widening. Uh, they're starting to come in a little bit now, which is good. Uh, but the big one, and this is what's been tripping up a lot of people is, and, and causing a lot of deals to fall out of escrow, is the agencies are putting in mandatory reserve requirements. And I think Fannie Mae is requiring a year of principal and interest and uh, uh, capital improvement reserves and uh, your tax and escrow insurance, uh, tax escrow and insurance escrow uh, payments. It's a massive amount of money uh, to be put into a lender controlled escrow account. Freddie Mac last I heard was at I think nine months of principal and interest only, uh, assuming an amortizing payment. So if you have an interest only payment, that doesn't count. Uh, it's the uh, amortizing payment. You're gonna be uh, reserving nine months of that payment into a lender controlled account. Uh, so you wanna be able, you wanna account for that money uh, that you're gonna need to raise that or have that money uh, set aside for the lender's reserve. But I'd go a step beyond that and think really carefully about the capital that you're going to uh, have on hand as reserves yourself, uh, even beyond what the lender's going to require. And, and so what we've done here is we've doubled our typical um, capital reserve requirement that we raise for our own just internal reserves. And we've added to that the lender's uh, reserve. Now you'll get the lender's reserve back and uh, Fannie and Freddie are different on how they treat when you get that back. Freddie has the uh, loosest restriction and it basically, I think it's 90 days after the state of emergency uh, in your area has been declared over. Now who knows when that'll happen, uh, but at least it's fairly well defined. Fannie Mae's is a lot more complicated and convoluted. I think it was almost two pages uh, on how to uh, qualify for getting the money back. So. A little bit more complicated process there, but you will get the money back. So kind of how we're looking at acquisitions right now is uh, uh, we're raising extra capital uh, for reserves, we're raising extra capital for the lender, and then we're assuming that we get that capital back from the lender after two years, and then we'll use that capital to do renovations in year two or three. lender return to us for renovations. And then we'll, uh, we'll do a refinance, pull a little bit of cash out, uh, maybe at year two or three, and use the balance of that cash that we receive from the refinance for the balance of any renovations, if we feel that doing a value add makes any sense as we come through the recovery. Uh, so that's kind of how we're looking at things. We're not looking at value adds day one right now. Uh, we don't think it makes a lot of sense to be uh, planning to do renovations early in the game and jacking up rents like might have been the case even uh, a month ago. So fundraising strategies, uh, how, do we, how do you raise funds uh, for your projects today? Uh, you know, we, uh, I, I think uh, now is a good time to be building the war chest. Uh, this is what we're doing here is I actually have our council right now writing up documents for our uh, our multifamily fund number six. And that fund will be raising money to, um, to invest in multifamily. We're gonna do a 506C offering that'll allow us to advertise, uh, even though we probably won't advertise, but since I just had a book come out, I wasn't gonna take any chances. Uh, so we're, um, we're gonna be raising money for a fund and, and doing that for the purpose of being ready when the uh, opportunities present themselves. So if you're on the sponsor side of the fence, uh, now is the time to think about uh, building your war chest and having capital ready so that when opportunities come, you can buy them. Because I'll tell you, who is going to get uh, the deal? Who's gonna get the deal? Well, the, the, the one that's gonna get it is the one that has the money. So if there's five bidders, and four of them have to go raise money from investors and the fifth one says, I'll pay cash and I'll close in three weeks. Uh, who's going to get it or who's going to get the better deal on that deal? It's going to be that one that's uh, capitalized and ready to go. So uh, that's why we're doing it is uh, I think we'll get the best opportunity and the best timing if we're ready. Uh, if you're not ready, 
uh, to raise a fund. And believe me, raising a fund is no easy task. Don't make this decision lightly. Uh, I did it years and years ago and struggled like hell uh, when we raised uh, money for a fund a long time ago. It's very difficult to raise money for a fund. Uh, so if you're not ready for a fund and you're going to go single asset, now is the time to document your track record. Uh, you know, look through everything you've done, create portfolios of before and after pictures, create uh, some, some exhibits to show your financial performance, show the rents that you projected versus the rents you delivered, the income you projected versus the income you delivered, the sale price you projected against the sale price you delivered. And I don't care whether it was a single family house flip uh, a, a single family home rental, a duplex, a hundred unit apartment complex, whatever your track record is, document that track record and, uh, and have a really good exhibit to show people why they should be investing with you. Because here's, a, uh, here's the bad news. Uh, people have been lying to you and uh, people have probably been telling you uh, when you find the deal, the money will come. Or when you get a deal there, you'll find investors. It will be no problem. The truth is that's all a lie. The real truth is, is that uh, people invest with people that they trust and they will only trust you if you give them a reason to. And, and that means either uh, they gave birth to you. That could be one reason they trust you uh, or they're related to you in some other way. They, sh they, they share DNA with you. They'll, they'll probably trust you but they, they really probably trust you because uh, you've shown them what you've been able to do. And you say, you know, look, here's the 730 properties that we've, uh, we've invested in. And, you know, here's kind of the things that we've done or our, you know, our team has, you know, at, at Praxis, it's like we say, you know, our team has 100,000 units of multifamily experience. Um, so, you know, we use that as our track record. Uh, you know, we've, we've got 30 years, uh, 30 to 40 years in business, 100,000 units of experience. We've operated in multiple states through multiple market cycles, and we've delivered results. And, and that, that's what makes people comfortable. So I'm going to leave you with talking about three trust curves. And the trust curves are uh, what I call the three things that you have to do if you're going to raise funds. Uh, you have to be able to accomplish all three of these. First, the first trust curve is you have to get people to trust you. So this is where you use your track record, your history, um, your, your everything you've got. You know, the, the fact that you're honest, your great haircut, whatever it is that you have uh, that, that, uh, that gets people to, uh, that sways people to trust you. That's what you have to do. So most people will start with their inner circle, right? Your circle of influence, your friends and family. The second trust curve is you have to get them. Actually, that's the second one. The first trust curve, you have to get them to trust real estate. I always forget this one because I skipped this one. You ha they have to trust real estate. First, they have to know, I want to invest in real estate. If they want to invest in real estate, the next thing is you got to get them to trust you to know you're the one to invest in real estate with, right? They want to invest in real estate with you. Now, the reason I always forget that first one and skip it is I don't ever start there. Uh, if you're starting at trust curve number one, where you got to get people to trust real estate, that means you're holding seminars at the IRA, you know, self-directed IRA conferences, and you know, you're going to businesses and giving presentations about investing in real estate. Um, you know, that's all well and good. And, you know, for a lot of people that works great. Uh, for me, we skip that. Uh, people come to us because they already want to invest in real estate, and that's when they come to us. So we've already gotten past that first one. So if you can pass the first one, great. If not, you still got to get people to convince that real estate's the right investment. Second, they got to know you're the right person to invest with. And the third trust curve is that they have to trust the investment that you're showing them. So that means that if you're going to bring them an offering uh, to invest in, you want to be able to show them that offering is worthy of their cash and the risk. And that means you want to be able to say, uh, you know, we use conservative assumptions and demonstrate that you use conservative assumptions and show them your, your assumptions and how they compare to market forecasts from uh, third party experts that are validating your thesis. Uh, you want to show them the financials and, and you know, how you're projecting the income and how you're projecting vacancy and occupancy and future rents and exit cap rates and all those other things that you've been thoughtful about your underwriting approach to show that there's a likelihood that you're going to actually deliver on the returns that you're promising. 
that you're not pulling too hard on the levers that cause you to show uh, a higher return than you're going to be capable of delivering uh, and that uh, the investment's going to produce a result that's going to be suitable for them and is going to accomplish their objectives. And if you can do all of those things, uh, then uh, you're, you're miles and miles and miles ahead. So uh, that is, uh, that's my show. So I'll, uh, I'll turn that part of it off and uh, I'll turn it back over to the, the kind folks that uh, invited me to be here. Right, thank you. This was phenomenal. We truly do appreciate it. Um, GK is following the questions, so he's going to uh, read them to you. GK, please go ahead. Yep. Hey, apologize for the uh, background noises of any. Um, so I'm just going to read down the questions in the, in the order that we got them, try and summarize or consolidate to the best extent possible. Um, so first question has to do with more of the asset management challenges that you're facing during a uh, um, health crisis. If there's a situation where you need to do uh, emergency repairs in a unit, but a tenant has some sort of immune compromised system or something that would leave them vulnerable to contracting coronavirus, how are you all handling these types of situations in your asset management? Yeah, so uh, by, generally speaking, we're, uh, we're limiting our uh, work orders to uh, urgent work orders only. Non-emergency work orders, uh, we're stacking up until um, after it's deemed a little bit more safe. Um, there are some non-emergent work orders we're able to accomplish by, like for example, they need smoke detector batteries replaced. We've uh, left the smoke detector batteries at the door with instructions on how to replace it, let the resident do it themselves. So that's been one strategy that we've used. If it's something that we think we can uh, kind of walk people through how to fix. Uh, if not, uh, then we have a procedure where uh, our maintenance technicians have full uh, PPE. They have a uh, full body uh, moon suits, basically, where they'll go in like a hazmat team uh, with, uh, with uh, masks, gloves, uh, you know, booties and a suit and the whole nine yards. Uh, they decontaminate all their tools prior to going in. Uh, they perform the repair. They decontaminate any surface they touched. When they exit, they decontaminate all their tools again, and then they change their PPE. Uh, now, if we had a particularly vulnerable resident that was inside that, uh, that unit, uh, if they were able to leave the unit during the time that our maintenance tech was going to be inside, we would encourage them to do so if they felt comfortable going outside, uh, you know, and maybe going down to the, you know, to the common area and, and, and waiting uh, down there without us being in there, we can do that. Otherwise, we'd have to do it with them in there and just in full PPE. Uh, if they're not comfortable with that, uh, we can't, we can't effect, uh, effectuate the repair. Obviously, if it's an emergency repair, like a water leak or something like that, that we have to address, uh, we just, you know, you have to do what you have to do. That means going in. Right. Um, so the next question that you guys, if you have a follow-up to that, definitely you can write that in the, uh, in the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll go to the next question. Um, this goes back to the discussion around the U-shaped U recovery, V-shaped recovery, or Nike shoes recovery, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> the individual would like, if you could expand a little bit more on why you think the U and the V are not really um, likely. Yeah, so, you know, a, a V-shaped recovery would basically mean that we get back to full business right away. I mean, almost everybody would have to get back to work quickly. Uh, for a U-shaped recovery, it would mean everybody gets back to work in a reasonably short period of time. And I just don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I just read today uh, that Pier 1 is closing all of their stores permanently. Uh, J.C. Penney just filed for bankruptcy, and I think they're closing like a third of their stores. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a restaurant chain in the San Francisco Bay Area that had 15 restaurants. They're closing all of them permanently. Uh, these, uh, the, these dominoes haven't yet fallen. And, you know, right now you've got this initial wave of layoffs came from non-essential businesses being forced to close their doors and send people home. And that was kind of the first wave. And during this wave, there's been plenty of government support to keep, uh, to 
give people money to be able to pay their expenses while that's been happening. Uh, however, uh, what's going to happen next is the result of all of this is people slow down, right? They stop doing the things they were otherwise doing. Uh, I have a, a, a condo in Hawaii that we rent out and there's literally, it was 100% occupied for the rest of the year. It is now zero. Everyone canceled. And, you know, there's going to be people that are going to rebook, but not everyone is going to rebook. Uh, there's going to be vacancy and that means less money in my pocket and less money I could spend on something else. Right. And the same is going to happen uh, to other landlords, whether you know, if you own an office building uh, and you rely on that office building's rental income to pay your expenses, you're probably going to have less income. If you're a real estate investor and you rely on transaction velocity, there's probably going to be less transactional velocity over the next year, which means less income. Uh, if you uh, work in the service industry, there's, if you're a, an airline pilot, uh, there's fewer flights. If you're a flight crew, if you're baggage handler, any of those things, it's going to take time for all of those things to come back, which means it's going to take time for people to get rehired because consumer spending is going to slow down for a period of time. And all of those things just mean a long drawn out recovery and while I would like to say there's going to be pent up demand that's going to swing this into a V-shaped recovery, I just don't see it. It's going to be a, it's going to take time for people to get back on airplanes. You know, Las Vegas relies heavily on uh, conferences, conventions, concerts. These are mass gatherings of people that are absolutely not going to happen in 2020. Uh, you know, major concert events are uh, almost all canceled throughout 2020. And that supports so many people when you think about it. There's ticket takers, there's ushers, there's food service people, there's the people that clean the porta potties. I mean, there's all this stuff uh, that all these businesses that, that trickles down and that's less consumer spending on behalf of not only the business owners that own those businesses, but the, employee, the employees that they otherwise would have employed to perform those functions. And that means that all of that stuff just creates a long-term slowdown. So I, I think it's a long road back, uh, I'm afraid to say. That's actually uh, from people who are currently, you know, just immediately got laid off. So there are more to come. So we have 32 million, some, somewhere around there. So uh, would you think that as some people will actually get back to work, you know, some people will be laid off and we pretty much might stay at the same rate for, for the foreseeable future. I think it's going to be elevated. I think you're going to see an immediate spike. I mean, when you remember when you saw the, did you see the charts of unemployment filings and how they like, literally it goes like this and then it went like that mm. uh, all in one week. Uh, yeah. It was a massive amount of unprecedented amount of unemployment filings. Cause you know, just an honest, every non-essential business was essentially shut down. Yeah. Um, you know, and now that's going to start crawling back. I mean, now they're talking about, okay, in California, they're just now talking about maybe reopening restaurants, not this week, but next week. Well, when they do that, they're going to do it at, at minimal capacity. Maybe it's 25% capacity. So maybe you have 25% of the servers that you had before. So not everybody comes right back to work. And I mean, I think at first people were thinking like, okay, there was 50 employees. They laid off all 50 of them because they had to shut the business down when they mm -hmm. opened back up. 49 of them are going to come back or 50 mm -hmm. of them are going to come back. Everybody's going to pick right back up where we left off. We unpause and here we go. Yeah. But the reality is it's not going to happen that way. They're going to bring five back and then they're going to bring five more back. And, you know, what happens to the other 40 that didn't come back yet? Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're not spending as much money on the things they might otherwise have done. You know, maybe they had a trip to Hawaii planned and they canceled it because it's like, geez, I'm not sure that I'm going to have the income or I, I blew through my savings to pay my rent. Now I'm going to cancel my Hawaii trip, or now I'm not going to go to that conference or that concert or whatever, the sporting events, or I'm going to sell my season tickets or, you know, whatever it is they're going to do to raise money, they're going to do to raise money uh, for themselves. Uh, and that means that that's money that didn't transfer into somebody else's hands. So that's, that's economic slowdown and it's lasting. Brian, uh, th this, um, um, you know, recession is probably in some ways, different from others but it's not nevertheless it, it will, will see some sort of recession but just like in any economic cycle 
um, there are always uh, people and businesses um, that suffer. And then there is uh, another end of the spectrum. There are businesses and companies and areas that benefit. Um, and, you know, we potentially may need additional medical offices. And uh, Trump already announced that the um, um, drugs, um, the, the generic drugs will, will be manufactured in the U.S., and I'm sure there is more um, uh, manufacturing facilities coming. So from that end of the spectrum, uh, do you think uh, there are benefits or there are areas within commercial real estate that will um, eventually profit and benefit um, from uh, this recession? I mean, I know it sounds negative, but you know, I was trying to say it in a positive yeah. light, but it, well, areas absolutely. where people can pick up. Yeah, there's, there's always an upside to every downside, right? And so in the 2008 recession, there was a lot of downsides. But for me, there was a huge upside because we bought foreclosed real estate. <laughs> and there were foreclosures everywhere in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12. So certainly there was an upside. Uh, you know, and I'll tell you, you know, right now, Cheesecake Factory stock has gone to almost zero. But yet, uh, my Amazon stock has done great. Amazon and Costco, they've been, you know, it's been going up, right? So, you know, there's, there's the other side of the coin. So, uh, you know, 2008's recession was caused by real estate. That's a big difference for us real estate investors, that there was a disease in real estate that caused the 2008 recession. So uh, values fell by half, right? Uh, I don't think that's happening again this time. This time, uh, real estate did not cause the recession, a virus did, and that's impacting real estate in a secondarily. So, uh, I don't think we're going to see massive tank, you know, massive devaluation in a lot of real estate sectors. Now, some will. Uh, think about retail. Retail may be shifted forever. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, right now in California, you got to wear masks everywhere. I hate wearing a mask. If I need to buy something, I'll buy it from Amazon so I don't have to go to the store and wear a mask. Uh, you know, it's like you know, that that shift out of retail is going to be a long lasting shift. Uh, it's been, it's already been in the works for years, and this is going to amplify it. Uh, offices, Twitter has said employees can work from home in perpetuity. They never have to come to the office again. Uh, there was another one that just said it today or yesterday. I forget which company it was. Twitter, I think. It was, or did I just say Twitter? Uh, I forget which one it was. There was another massive tech company that just announced all their employees could work from home in perpetuity. Uh, so, you're starting to see more and more of this uh, where people are realizing, gosh, you know, with high speed internet, uh, people are productive and Zoom and all these other things. Uh, so office properties may be in a long lasting downturn as a result of COVID, uh, as well as hospitality, restaurant properties, uh, hotels, uh, they may be in a long lasting downturn. Uh, where is their positivity? Well, housing is always somewhat positive because you know, there's the old adage that says everybody needs a place to live. Now, I've long preached that's a hoax and people can live in their mother's house or in a basement or under a bridge. Doesn't mean they're going to live in your apartment. Uh, I still believe that is true. However, there still has to be some amount of housing and there will always be demand for it. Uh, but I think uh, the shining star may turn out to be industrial real estate, factories, warehousing, storage, uh, um, that, that kind of infrastructure, trucking, logistics, uh, you know, that might be the shining star of real estate. The thing is, is most small game real estate investors aren't in that space uh, for obvious reasons. It's very specialized and, you know, financing is different and, you know, a return on a, you know, single tenant FedEx distribution center is not like a multifamily apartment complex. But you know, there, there could be opportunities in that space in buying small distribution warehouses and, and that kind of stuff. So yes, there's always an upside somewhere. Uh, as Jim Cramer always says, you know, there's always a bull market somewhere. My job is to find it for you. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I mean, we, we're finishing up uh, uh, spring cleaning in our mobile home communities, welcoming new tenants. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Yeah, mobile home communities, you know, it's a, I, I'm mixed, I have mixed feelings about mobile home communities. On, on one hand, uh, there's, a, there's a stickiness to it, right? Because people have a home on the property and, you know, there's that stickiness. Uh, but there's also the factor that, um, 
that it's the it the the population base in a mobile home park community is made up of two primary categories. One is retirees. Well, you're going to be okay there because their social security check come either way. The other is people in the service industry, and they've been the one that's been most heavily impacted. So I, I'm not sure what's going to happen in the mobile home park space. Like the jury's still out on that one. Um, I, I think it has a better chance than not of doing okay, uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't bet too heavily on it yet. But we'll see. Might be great. I don't know. I'm not in that space, so I, I can't testify with a, a, a high degree of authority. Okay. Um, we jump in the next question here. Um, so the next one, uh, this is more about macro uh, economic, I guess, impacts, if you will. How do you see the coming presidential elections impacting the recovery? Well, the, uh, the initial uncertainty, I think, is, is going to um, play a role in the economy to some extent. Uh, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen and what the outcome is going to be. Uh, I think ultimately the result uh, is, is going to have an impact. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I have a feeling that uh, if the Democrats get control of both uh, sides of the legislature and the White House, um, real estate could be in for a shock. Uh, as long as that doesn't happen, uh, then I think we'll be okay. Even no matter what the outcome is of the presidential election, as long as there's no unified control of government, uh, you know, there should be a, a, enough checks and balances to at least maintain what we've got and not lose too much of it. Uh, if you look at California, for example, California has had a transition to one party rule. And as a result, it's been thrown into a state of, you know, homelessness and despair and disgust uh, in a lot of areas. And, uh, you know, California doesn't have a lot of things going for it other than nice warm weather. Uh, so not a lot of good reasons to invest in real estate here. Uh, but outside of California, uh, you know, things have uh, look a lot better. And so if the, if the United States doesn't make the same mistake California made, uh, it'll probably be okay. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so we have a question here about someone with prior real estate investing experience. What would you recommend to someone who wants to begin their multifamily portfolio right now? They already have capital. They've done flips in the past. Um, what is your opinion of how this relates and how they can potentially leverage that and go into multifamily at this point in the market? So there's, there's two different ways that people go into multifamily, quote unquote. One way is they take the capital that they have and they go buy a duplex, triplex, fourplex, 10 unit apartment building. That's how I did it. Uh, I started small and then I worked my way into larger properties over time. Uh, so, you know, my, my advice, if you're going to take that route is get educated. Uh, there's plenty of books out there on how to invest in, uh, in income real estate, uh, you know, there's uh, Dave Lindahl's wrote some good books on investing in income properties and market cycles. Um, there's uh, there, there's all sorts of books. Uh, I, I think uh, on bigger pockets, you can probably find a couple books. I know Brandon Turner's writing one now that'll probably be a year out before that hits the shelves. But there's uh, there's uh, all kinds of educational resources out there that don't cost a lot of money to learn uh, the landscape. And I would suggest study up now because you got all the time in the world right now, right? We're locked up, uh, use it to educate yourself. And then, uh, and then watch and wait for opportunity. Don't be in a hurry to get in. It's better to be six months too late than six months too early. So, you know, just watch and wait for the right opportunity. Be patient and wait for it to come to you and, you know, use your capital. If you're, if the other way people get into multifamily, quote unquote, is they become a sponsor of multifamily offerings where they raise money from other people to invest in larger multifamily. And, and that's what I do now. And I worked my way into that by starting with the smaller assets and proving that I could do it and learning my, learning the ropes and kind of learning how it's done. I really suggest 
uh, taking the first approach, learn the business, get a track record, and then grow and expand organically over time as opposed to trying to launch right in and go, okay, I've done a few flips. I'm going to go buy a 150 unit apartment complex. Um, if you're inclined to ignore my advice and just go and do that anyway, which most many people are, you have to learn your mistakes on your own. Nobody listens to some guy on a thing and says, Oh, all right, I won't do that. That was my dream. I'm just going to dream killer is going to kill my dream. I'm just going to go best in duplexes. If you're going to go do it anyway, at least do yourself and your investors a favor and, and buy Gene Trowbridge's book called It's a Whole New Business. And that book will teach you all about structuring offerings and, you know, PPMs and all that other stuff. Uh, maybe buy Dave Lindahl's book on raising money. Buy uh, Bigger Pockets uh, has a book on raising private capital, uh, Matt Faircloth. Uh, by the hands-off investor written by yours truly that just came out a couple weeks ago, even though it's written for the investor that's going to invest in an asset. Uh, I would say if what you're doing is you're going to school and you, uh, you want to pass the final exam, get the book that has all the answers to the test. And that's what this book is, right? The, your, uh, the proctors of your exam are going to be the investors that will invest with you later on down the line. Know all the questions they're going to ask you and how you should be answering those. Uh, it's all in my book, so get that and, and read up on that. So educate, 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 uh, practice, practice, practice. It's like anything else. I learned how to fly airplanes when I was in high school. I did it by studying in ground school, and I did it by studying in the air with a flight instructor. Do yourself a favor and do both of those things. Otherwise, all you'll be able to do is figure out how to take off and fly yourself to the scene of the crash. Okay. Um, so next question we have, uh, this is more about deal acquisition, uh, uh, the type of metrics that you're looking at to acquire a deal. And uh, I think ultimately also present to your investors, how has increasing your reserve impacted your IRRs and your projections and are doing deals still attractive at this point based on that impact? So it, it hasn't impacted our returns at all. Uh, raising additional money has not impacted our return. Uh, having to uh, raise money for lender reserves has not impacted our return. Higher interest rates have not impacted our return. Lower future rent has not impacted our return. Uh, lower rent growth projections have not impacted our return. Our projected return stays the same as it ever was. It's going to be somewhere in that 12% to 15% IRR range is what we're going to deliver in order to raise money. Now, what it does impact is it impacts the price we can pay for real estate because I might have generated a 15% IRR on a $30 million property with 5% annual rent growth, a $200 bump day one, no, you know, very minimal reserves, uh, a 3.5% mortgage interest rate, with five years of IO and all of those things. And now in order for me to do the same 15% return with 0% rent growth for two years, no lift day one, uh, no immediate renovation, raising more money for reserves, having a little bit higher mortgage interest rate means that that $30 million property is now a $22 million property. So that's the difference. It hasn't impacted my return. It's impacted the return of my seller because they're not going to be able to deliver to their investor what they promised if they sell to me at the price it's going to require for me to transact uh, and deliver the return that I need to deliver to my investors to get them excited. Now, we have all these different levers to pull on and underwriting is really an exercise in financial engineering. But what we have to make sure that we're doing, it's garbage in, garbage out. Uh, you know, don't use improper inputs just to give yourself uh, a higher return at the same price as you would have in February. Uh, it's not going to work. It's going to fall flat. You'll fail to deliver. Your investors will hate you uh, and you'll be out of business. You'll be a one and done or be the first deal in your last deal. Don't let yourself be that guy. Okay. So I think we only have time for one more question. Um, so I'm going to, pick a random here. I think this one here. Oh, no. One more. 
Um, okay, so why invest in a fund like the one you're raising? Why, um, why not wait as an investor if we believe prices and NOIs are likely to decline? Uh, well, so a couple of reasons. So first of all, there, there's two kinds of investors that are investing passively in offerings. One kind has to, uh, in order to satisfy themselves, they have to uh, do a side-by-side -side analysis of the real estate and make sure that they believe all of the sponsors' uh, uh, projections, all of the sponsors' assumptions, and that they, re, uh, they uh, underwrite to the same return the sponsor is underwriting to before they make that investment. That investor is the perfect investor for single asset syndications where you can see the real estate you're gonna be investing in. You can go, oh, great, it's uh, not only is it in Atlanta, but it's on the Northwest side of Atlanta. And I like that part of town, but you know, I don't like the Northeast side or you know, whatever it is, whatever hot button they have. Or I had a guy that's like, I won't invest in anything that has uh, two bedroom, one bath units, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, there's always, everybody has their hot button. If that's you, uh, then you're probably not going to invest in a fund. You're going to invest in a single asset syndication and that would be the right road for you to take. There are other investors that say, Hey, that's not as important to me. Instead, it's more important that I invest with the right sponsor. I invest with someone whose strategy I believe in, who has a box, an investment box that makes sense that underwrites to uh, assumptions that make sense given today's reality, that has a track record of delivering on the results that they've promised, has survived through multiple market cycles, has an extensive footprint and extensive experience and track record and all that stuff. And if I find that person, I'll invest in any deal they do. If that's you as an investor, a fund is perfect for you. Now let's talk about some of the differences of how uh, one may be beneficial over the other. The single asset syndication is beneficial because you can see the asset. The fund is beneficial because you get a couple of things. One, you get diversification. With one investment, you can invest in two, three, four, five, ten, however many properties the fund is ultimately going to acquire. And that diversification may be across uh, different properties or it may even be across different cities or even different states. So if diversification is important to you, and let's say you have $100,000 to invest, uh, you can't, and you got a $100,000 minimum, you can't invest a million dollars by putting 100,000 in 10 different offerings. But you could put 100,000 into one fund that invests in 10 different properties and achieve the same diversification that somebody with a million dollars to invest 100 grand times 10 is going to achieve. So that's one reason why a fund makes sense. The other reason why a fund makes sense is timing advantage. And that means that, you know, I'm going to have callable capital so that at, for me as a fund, when I talk to a seller or a broker and they say, you know, I've got five offers, what makes you stand out? Well, what makes me stand out is I have the cash. Uh, it's sitting right here or it's callable and, uh, and I can get that cash very quickly and we can close fast and it's reliable and there's no execution risk. There's no risk that we can't raise the money from our investor race. There's, you know, and all those things. So you can tell a different story to the seller. And that means if you have a seller that needs to sell, not one that wants to sell, but one that needs to sell, they need to transact quickly and they need to transact certainly. So that means number one, I need to know 100% you can close. A fund buyer can promise that. Number two is they need to know, they got, hey, I got a mortgage maturity or I'm going to notice a default. I've got to be out in 30 days. The guy who has to go raise money is not closing in 30 days. Not happening. The fund can close in 30 days. So there's advantages. You're going to capture the best deal with a fund investment uh, than you would over single asset. So those are the main two reasons. Now, as to you say, well, why don't I just wait? Well, you can do both. I mean, for me as a fund sponsor, you know, we're drafting documents now because we know it's going to take 30 to 45 days to have uh, documents ready to launch. It's going to take two or three months for us to raise, you know, 50 million bucks or whatever, whatever amount we're going to raise, you know, maybe, I mean, we've, we've raised 7 million in 30 hours before. So who knows, maybe it goes fast, but nevertheless, it takes time to raise money. So, you know, we know that we're just, building our war chest, circling the wagons now so that when 
that NOI drop comes or whatever it is that happens, um, we're, ready to, we're ready to pounce. But here's something that I, I wanna make sure people are, are aware of. You're going to see NOI drops and you're already seeing NOI drops, most specifically in the sectors of real estate that were most in danger. Uh, hospitality, hotel, you know, hotel, office, retail, that type of stuff. Multifamily hasn't seen a drop in NOI for the most part, most properties. Ours, we had three properties that in April had record high collections, record high ownership to date collections and are tracking May even higher than April. Every one of our properties, except for one, collected more money in April than it did in March and all of them are tracking in parallel in May. So we are not seeing a drop in NOI. What we are seeing is we're seeing a drop in forecasted rent growth. We're seeing a drop in forecasted bad debt. We're seeing a drop in forecasted or an increase in forecasted uh, bad debt, an increase in forecasted concessions, an increase in forecasted vacancy. And those assumptions are causing us to have to buy at a lower price, i.e. A, a higher cap rate for the same NOI. The same income stream is resulting in a lower price. Cap rate decompression is what's resetting market pricing. Now, the challenge is, is there's a bid ask spread. And I'm on this, I'm on both sides of the fence. I'm a buyer and a seller. We have a property that was in the final stages of best and final offer rounds right when COVID came out. We literally received offers the week we all went on lockdown. And you know, the offers were incredible. Prices above what we expected, way above what we expected. Now, uh, here we are, we put the transaction on freeze because of COVID and, you know, the buyer got scared of, you know, multiple buyers at the same price all got scared of, well, what happens if income drops? We don't want to put hard money up and then have income fall off. I understand that. Let's just put this on ice and revisit after there's more certainty in the economy. So here I am as a seller, I'm telling the, uh, the broker, you know, our income hasn't fallen. In fact, it went up. Our collections are up month over month since we uh, put the contract on freeze. So our price shouldn't change at all. And then out of the other side of my mouth, I'm talking to the other broker going like, hey, that deal you that's coming that fell out of escrow you want us to buy? Well, our price went down 25% because we have no rent growth. We have no, uh, you know, we have higher this and that and all these other things. And we have the reserves required by Fannie and Freddie. So for that reason, our price is falling. So, you know, buyers don't want to pay as much. Sellers don't want to drop price. So there's the bid ask spread where literally right now there is zero transaction velocity and it's going to stay that way until one or the other gives in and either sellers are going to realize, gosh, this is going to be here for a while. This isn't a V-shaped recovery. We're going to be stuck with this. This is the new normal. I've got a price to reality and sell or buyers are gonna say, oh, well, gee, uh, you know, jobs are coming back and rent growth is coming back and I have renovations I've been doing and I've been getting my post-renovated rent and you know, income is up and vacancies are down and you know, job growth is back. Uh, I have more confidence in the market. I can now change my inputs. Uh, those buyer and seller uh, bid ask spread has to reconcile somehow and until it does, nothing is happening. So, you know, what's going to happen is the guy at the fund level is going to have money ready. He's going to be the first one there uh, when uh, the bid ask spread comes to zero. Ryan, I think we have uh, just a few minutes and I was uh, messaging uh, Chicken that I wanted to just ask, you know, quick question. I don't know if too, if we have a moment. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, being a conservative, how much do you guys like to keep on hand as reserves 10% more or is it property specific it's property specific but and, and class specific but generally speaking uh -huh. um, a minimum that we like to have on hand is one month's debt service plus 1% uh -huh. of the value of the real estate so you know a 30 million dollar property is probably going to have about four hundred thousand dollars in free cash we're doubling that now where we're doing 2%. So that would be $800,000 in cash plus a month's debt service. Okay. That's our starting point. And, you know, and that also means that we raised enough money to fund all uh, utility company deposits. 
all escrow reserves, you know, the three months cushion, you have to put in a tax and insurance reserve. It means that we paid the entire first year insurance premium up front. Uh, you know, it means that we've put my, we've already uh, accounted for all of those other reserve components. And we're just talking about cash that sits in the bank account. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. And one last thing I hope it's quick. Um, you know, you mentioned you had third party management. Now you brought it in house. Why? When? Was it planned or just yeah, why third party right, management no. was it planned and when did we do it? <clears throat> so uh, I resisted it for a long time. I hate the property management business. It's probably the worst business there is. I never wanted to be in the property management business, but uh, you know, I, third party management was working great for us. The problem was we wanted to raise money from institutional investors and institutional investors have come to learn that sponsors that manage their own portfolio and have full control A to Z of their, of their destiny do better than sponsors that utilize outside vendors for that very important role. So yeah. I knew that we needed to bring it in house if we wanted to capture the attention of institutional investors. The other thing was, is that I had the talent in front of me. I had a, just a unique opportunity where I had the people that were experts in this industry that came at the just the right time that said, hey, we're looking for an opportunity. And I'm like, gosh, I've never wanted to do this, but this is my chance. And you bring basically mm -hmm. 40 years of experience and can build this for me so I don't have to do it. That was the second component. Uh, and we did it three years ago. Perfect. Thank you. Ryan, thank you so much. Uh, this was great. Uh, guys, we're at the top of our hour, but I think uh, Brian has answered a lot of questions and as always has uh, over delivered. So this was pretty much expected. Thank you so much for your presentation, Brian. We really enjoyed it. Uh, for those that couldn't stay till the end, the presentation has been recorded. So we'll share the recording for those that want to uh, listen to it again. Thank you so much, everyone. And I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy at home. Thanks for having Thank me you. on. Thank you very much. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.